Hello, my name is Tova Felchu, and this is my life in the theater. I was born Terry Sue Felchu in an undisclosed decade. As I grew up, I noticed that Terry was both a boy and a girl's name, which wasn't in vogue in the times that I was a little girl. And also Terry had a lot of R's in it. I was at my first professional job in Matunic, Rhode Island as Terry Fairchild. I changed Felchu to Fairchild because I had a boyfriend and he, his name was Michael Fairchild. And as we were head to head in Matunic, Rhode Island one night, he said to me, what kind of a name is Terry Sue for a girl like you? You're from the North. It sounds so Southern. What else were you called? And I said, well, I was called Tova in Sunday school. And actually Tova is my authentic Hebrew name. And he said, Tova, now that's a name. And so I became Tova Felchu. And like most adolescents, I think it was 17 or 18, I had no idea what the consequences of that would be for changing my name from Terry Sue to Tova Felchu would change the landscape of my entire life and my entire artistic life. But it has been a very rich and good one and one that I know will continue. I have a vision that I'm going to live to 104. This is not a wish, this is a vision. Think Betty White, I'm working right into my 90s and my agents are thrilled. I was a pianist at the National Music Camp in Interlochen, Michigan, now called Interlochen Center for the Arts. And I would get to finals for the concerto competitions for two summers in a row, playing the Mendelssohn G minor my first summer, 1963, and playing the Mozart D minor in my second summer, 1964. I got to the finals with both competitions and I never won concertos. And it was then that I decided that maybe I wasn't cut out to be a solo instrumentalist, to be in a cinder block cabin five hours a day alone on a piano going like this. And I said, maybe I should try out for plays with music. And the minute I did, I was cast as Cousin Hebe in HMS Pinafore at the Gilbert and Sullivan um, uh, production at, at Interlochen, which had 110 students. And there were only three singing parts. It was Buttercup, there was the leading lady, and of course there was Cousin Hebe. And just singing, and we are his sisters and his cousins and his aunts, it gave me hope. It was light at the end of a dark tunnel, and I changed from being a pianist to going into the theater. Do I just open the book? So, let's start. Cyrano, with Christopher Plummer at the Palace Theater. I had won the McKnight Fellowship in acting to the Tyrone Guthrie Theater the minute I graduated from Sarah Lawrence College. And at the Tyrone Guthrie for two seasons, I understudied all the size seven leading ladies. And understudy did not have her own costume in those days. We had to fit into the costume of the leading lady. I had 22 roles in 11 plays. In Cyrano, originally, the one we did with Paul Hecht before this became a musical with Chris, I would come on as a little actress, exit, come on as a boy poet, exit, come on as a nun. And that was my show. I think the costume changes were more important than the very few lines I had to say. When it was time for me to inherit the part of Hermia, I was called into Michael Langham's office and he said to me, there's a very important actor in this company and his wife wants your part. And for the sake of the company, I'm going to give her Hermia and not you. You can see from my face, not only how devastated I was, but he actually did me a favor, Mr. Langham, because it was clear to me after that that the Guthrie was not a place for me to stay and progress, that I would never get the patronage there that I would need to progress in my career. So, Christopher Plummer comes in with a musical of Cyrano. It's to be directed by Michael Langham. It's going to star Chris and various fancy actors from New York and from the Stratford Company. 
and Michelle Shea, who was also a leading lady of the Guthrie and played Kate in Taming of the Shrew opposite Len Garrio, she left the Guthrie to go start the Negro Ensemble Company in New York, leaving her part, the role she was offered in Cyrano, which was the food seller. It had 14 lines in a red dress, vacant. And Michael Langham said, let's give it to this Felchu kid. She can sing and she can dance. Let me tell you, the Guthrie, when I was there, if you didn't know iambic pentameter, they went like this. They thought you were just a little cut above a, a, a circus performer, which is something I would do in Pippin many years later, and I loved it. In all events, I could sing and I could dance, and it was a musical. They gave me Michelle Shea's role. Thank you, darling. I'm in your debt. And we played the Guthrie, and one day we came to rehearsal with the Guthrie, and Michael Langham was missing because he had been fired and he was replaced by Michael Kidd, the great choreographer of Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, Hello Dolly. He came in from Hollywood, and if you couldn't sing and dance, <coughs> you were cut from the show. And all of a sudden, what did not have perceived value, where I started at the Guthrie, had tremendous perceived value under the baton of Michael Kidd. And one day at rehearsal, he said, can anybody do a cartwheel? I said, I can do a cartwheel. I can do a cartwheel, sir. And he goes, felt you, the end of uh, act one, from now till forever. I remember that was the song. I want you to do car two cartwheels from stage right to stage left and then come down stage and start singing. And if I had to name another memoir that I would write besides Lilyville, I would call it and she can do cartwheels because it saved my job. And Cyrano went from the Guthrie to the Royal Alexandra in Toronto, on to the Colonial Theater in Boston and opened up the Palace Theater May the 13th, 1973, 50 years ago this year. In my debut on Broadway, I had the first line of the play. Oranges, pomegranates, lemonade. And I figured with my two pairs of false eyelashes or whatever we wore those days, I figured I'd be in the chorus the rest of my life, and I'd better start studying, because was I even good enough to be an ensemble member? I took tap at Farnsworth Howard. I took acrobatics. I was in the acrobatics class with a woman named Wasserstein, and this was the mother of Wendy Wasserstein. So uh, I remember our teacher would say, uh, what she say, all grandmas go first, Mrs. Wasserstein, all children in training bras go second. Tova, <laughs> never you mind. If you can find him, you can have him. Anyway, the play would close in six weeks. The minute I started to audition, I was cast. And we go on. I was cast in an ill-fated musical called Brainchild. I got the title role. I was the brainchild. There was a picture of my brain in my face across the Hellinger stage, when we were, come, we were supposed to come into Broadway. It never got out of the Forest Theater in Philadelphia, and it was produced by Adela Holzer, who would then be indicted, and I actually had to go down to the courts um, with Jerry Schoenfeld, who was the head of the Schubert organization at the time, and we were cross-examined by Roy Cohn as to the character of Adela Holzer. Adela Holzer may have committed a business crime, but she was very good to her actors, and we were paid. She took care of us, and I guess that's what they wanted me to say, but I spoke from the truth. She was very good to us, and uh, she would go to prison, and, the, and that musical never came in. But I was on my launch. From there, I met David Merrick and was offered the standby to Bernadette Peters and Mac and Mabel, and I said to Mr. Merrick, I can't do this job. He said, are you crazy? This isn't even the understudy. You can call in from your apartment if you want. I said, Mr. Merrick, I have understudied for two years of my precious life and never went on. You have to over-prepare yourself. You are under-rehearsed and you are expected to hit the mark of the person you're subbing for. And you already have prejudice, perceived prejudice against that. I said, I will never do that again and I'm done. If you ever have a role for me, the answer is yes. And there was a role for me in a play called Dreyfus in Rehearsal. It was 1974, so we, I had come to New York in 73. I was a leading lady at Stage West. I only wanted to be a leading lady in repertoire. I would go to Stage West and do a little-known musical called The Drunkard by a little-known composer named Barry Manilow. 
and also did uh, Arena in the Cherry Orchard with Armand Asante. But I had the ingenue leads. I, I, I was pursuing my life as a classical actress. But when I came back to New York, we got Brainchild, we got the standby for Mac and Mabel, and then Mr. Merrick came to me and said, I have a play, it's called Dreyfus in Rehearsal. We want you to play Alfred Dreyfus's wife, Lucy Dreyfus. I said, I'd be thrilled. You have to meet the director, Garson Kanan. And Garson Kanan was the director of the original Funny Girl with Barbara Streisand in 1964. So the part of Lucy Dreyfus is being played by a Polish actress named Miriam Polotnik. So it's a Polish acting troupe acting the trial of Alfred Dreyfus and the tribulations of Alfred Dreyfus. And I said, do I audition? And Mr. Merrick said, no, you just have to, to meet him. And I met him. And by the time I got home, I had gotten the part. And I said, how could this happen? I said hello to this guy. And he asked me a few questions. Apparently, he turned to David Merrick. He said, Miriam Polodnik, Tova felt you. With a name like that, she's got to be right. And they gave it to me. So I made my dramatic debut in 1974 in Dreyfus. The show ran two weeks. It was starring uh, the great Ruth Gordon and the wonderful Sam Levine. And, um, directed by Garson, who would, re these people remained lifelong friends. As a matter of fact, Ruth Gordon was the matron of honor at my wedding to Andrew Harris Levy, and Garson Kanan was the witness of the marriage contract. Wow, wow. And our firstborn child is Garson Brandon Levy, after Garson Kanan and his great-grandfather, Gershon Kaplan, who came from Russia to London to marry my grandmother. In all events, Dreyfus opened, Dreyfus closed. During that time, I also was auditioning, and I got Amy in Where's Charlie, opposite Ralph Julia. Once in love with Amy, always, right? Tap dancing, British, not Jewish, perfect. Broadway, Circle in the Square, $500 a week. I even remember the salary. I probably could have been an accountant if I wasn't an actor. Anyway, and then this Yentl the Yeshiva boy, Okay, I just finished Dreyfus. My name is Tova Felchu, typecasting, $132 a week at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. That was their black box theater, the Chelsea Theater, under Michael David and the wonderful Robert Calvin. And I said, well, we'll take, we'll take. Where's, Char where's Charlie? And on the 104 bus to return the script of Yentl to my agent, Star Kesselton, who was at 119 West 57th Street, I read, script and when I got to his office I said is the part gone he said no get on the subway go for it and I got it I got Yentl in Yentl and we had to tell Ted Mann that I wasn't going to do where's Charlie and my commercial agent said look you have a choice where's Charlie is a revival Yentl is an original and a new piece and you have the title role how many title roles do you think you're going to get in your life so we took Yentl, we opened Off-Broadway at the Chelsea Theater. Cheryl Crawford became a producer along with Mo Septi and Victor Potamkin of Potamkin Cadillac. God bless you. God bless you rich people who love the theater. We want to make you money so you can produce more plays. I'm in your corner. Yentl opened uh, way off Broadway in Brooklyn. You couldn't get in the door. There were lines around the block. It reminds me of what happened to Golda's Balcony when we were off Broadway. There were lines around the block. It was a, it was a wonderful experience. And Yentl would transfer to the O'Neill Theater that next season, the 1975-76 season. And in the interim, I did Rogers and Hart for Richard Rogers, and he was alive. So he was there, Buster Davis was uh, conducting the orchestra, and I remember I was given my romance, which I loved, and then I was given Why Can't I, and I went to rehearsal and I went, uh, feeling the way I do, I'd like to say I do, heaving a heavenly sigh. And Richard Rogers came to me and said, no, 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 he had throat cancer by this point, no, no, no. Feeling the way I do, I'd like to say I do. <laughs> I said, okay, Mr. Rogers, whatever you say. Feeling the way I do, I'd like to say I do, heaving a heavenly sigh. And <laughs> I did it. I did whatever he told me. And then he would offer me Rex to play Anne Boleyn in the first act and young Princess Elizabeth I in the second act, opposite Nicole Williamson on Broadway. Um, 
Richard Rodgers writing the music. It was a flat out offer. I never auditioned. And I was already uh, going to go to Broadway with Yentl. Neither contract was finished. I had an out clause seven weeks after Yentl opened to go into rehearsal for Rex and to leave Yentl. So, Yentl opens on Broadway. And it's a smashing success. Isaac Bishev, a singer, would go on to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. Um, I would say that the New York audiences supported that play. You couldn't get a seat for months to come. And the reason I know this is that it was time to leave for Rex. And Ruth, who was now uh, still a very close ally, Ruth Gordon said, Tova darling, Tova darling, you gotta go. You got this name, Tova Felchu, and you gotta, you gotta go. You gotta go, go, go to Rex. You know, you don't wanna be typecast. Against Ruth Gordon's advice, I did not leave Yentl, mostly because Mo Septi and Victor Potamkin took me on a walk and said, stay with us, we'll double your salary, and we'll put you up on the marquee. And I was no longer making $132 a week. I was making a good salary anyway. And then they, they doubled it. And I went up on my first marquee in 1975 and would get my first nomination for Yentl. And uh, I owe everything to Bob Calfin and his belief in me, to Cheryl Crawford, who then introduced me to Lee Strasberg and I got into the, got into the actor's studio. I agree with many great artists, Emilio Sosa is one of them, that life is about relationships and our work is still about relationships. That you know you're a success, not with the first offer, but with the second, patronage. And how do you have patronage? Well, you gotta be easy to work with. You gotta wanna do the job and you gotta dig deep. You gotta excavate your parts. And there was no stone unturned to play Yentl. I was snuck into a, an all boy yeshiva in Borough Park by a fabulous recalcitrant rabbi named Rabbi Arya Kaplan. I mean, a genius. He, I think, is gone now, but thank you, thank you. I studied those boys like I had one minute more to live. I studied those boys as if I was in the last day of my life and studied Yentl and studied the Buba Metziah and all these religious things. I was not brought up uh, as an Orthodox Jew. I am not kosher, um, but the name Tova Felchu has put me on a horse that often gallops in a certain direction. And as long as the role is great, why turn it down? Everybody's different, whether it's Yentl, Golda Meir, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who I've recently played, or Ruth Westheimer. These are great human souls who have great differentiation if you go deep enough. How specific can we be? And how deep can we go so we can get into the river of common human experience? Okay, so Yentl open. I didn't leave for Rex. Nicole Williamson slugs a chorus member, actually a friend of mine, an acquaintance of mine who had done Rogers and Hart, and he's taken up on charges, and the show closes. And Mr. Rogers took me out to lunch at Sardi's, and he said, I guess it wasn't a good idea. I said, it was a great idea. It was a great idea to begin with, Henry. Henry VIII and his six wives. I mean, look at six. And I, I had a relationship with Richard Rogers till the day he died, for which I'm most grateful. Okay, Yentl closes. Right after I marry Andrew, I go do the Holocaust miniseries. So I went from carrying roses to carrying guns and wearing a, a fatigue jackets and crawling along the ground to play a Czech freedom fighter with Joe Bottoms in the miniseries of Holocaust. And when I came home, I auditioned for a piece that was being written about Dona Flor and her two husbands called Sava. It was Brazilian. I could sing and dance. I got the role. Thank you, Mitch Lee. Thank you, Mitch Lee. Thank you, Rick Atwell, who directed me. And Sarava played in Boston, and Richard Nash left the team in Boston, and we could not change a word under the rules of the, of the Writers Guild. And the piece never fully blossomed into its full glory. We opened at the Mark Hellinger, and then we would transfer to the Broadway. We played the entire season, and Mitch Lee, who not only wrote Man La Mancha, but is a brilliant businessman, decided not to open our show, just to run previews, and he did that first commercial. That, I think Pippin did a commercial, but we did a commercial. 
Sadava means hello, stranger, ciao, shalom. Uh, uh, uh. Anyway, we sold out that theater for months, and then the critics stormed the theater. I did very well. A lot of the actors did very well. I would get a second nomination from that. And uh, the play did not do as well. The musical did not do as well. And it would close, but it, it, it went on for several months. So Sarava opened and closed. Yeah. I got married, we went to Hollywood for five years, and in 1983, Garson Brandon Levy was born uh, in L.A. And from the hospital bed, holding a newborn infant, I turned to Andy and I said, we've got to get home. I said, we have four living grandparents that we love, and New York is our home, and I have to, I have to come back to my roots. And of course, I've been coming back to the theater. Gene Feist of the Roundabout Theater was kind enough to offer me the Master Builder. The trouble is he offered it to me on July 30th and I'd given birth 48 hours before. I was 3,000 miles away and I was breastfeeding a child. This is a problem when you want to do the Master Builder. So I couldn't take it, unfortunately. But we did return to New York. We settled at 110 Riverside Drive, which was the building of Babe Ruth. And I would go back to Broadway I guess when Amanda was being potty trained, I did lend me a tenor. So it had to be around 1990. Jerry Zatz and Marty Starger cast me as Maria Morelli in Lend Me a Tenor. This was the first production, new play by the marvelous Ken Ludwig. Uh, Tony Walton did the sets. William Ivy Long did the costumes. Jerry Zatz directed. And I was working opposite Phil Bosco, Victor Garber, and Ron Holgate. It doesn't get better than that. Also, Jay Smith Cameron was in it, and she's a marvelous, marvelous actress. Uh, we opened in Baltimore under a wonderful woman named Quackenbush. I'll never forget that. She ran the Mechanic Theater, and Marty put in the budget an extra week in Baltimore to get all the props, the slamming doors, everything shined up so that we had a real chance to succeed and we succeeded. We opened on Broadway, and I know that Amanda, my littlest one, definitely was, was potty training her up in my dressing room with, of course, I was with uh, my assistant or with the nanny. The child wasn't alone when I would make my entrances. When Amanda got married, the headline on the announcement in the New York Times said, Broadway baby takes a co-star. That made me feel wonderful. Because that child, uh, by the time she was able to walk at 13 months, knew what a Broadway stage was. I also had Brandon's entire first grade class from Collegiate come to the Royal Theater, that's what it was called, and step on the stage because they could say they had been on a Broadway stage and they would say their name. So you can always say for the rest of your life that you were at the Royal Theater on 45th between Broadway and 8th and you, you set a line uh, on a Broadway stage. It was a wonderful experience. I got my third nomination, I was very grateful for it. And somewhere along the line, after Lend Me a Tenor, yes, I did Hello Mata, Hello Fada, Here I Am in Camp Granada. My wonderful agent, uh, David Kladner, at that time, said, you gotta take this. I said, why do I have to take this? He said, because it has tremendous humor and it's silly and you need to be goofy and silly. You've done Yentl, you've done Sarava. You've done Lend Me a Tenor. I said, well, Lend Me a Tenor was hysterical. I remember coming in and, and, and saying to my husband, I was so angry at Ron Holgate because he was a womanizer. And I would say, he, he, he goes into the restaurant, he always looks at the bosoms, he looks at the bosoms. <laughs> Meanwhile, I, at, the, at the costume fitting, William Ivy Long, whom I just adore and have been with him for many of the shows I've had the honor of doing, said, what do you want to look like? I said, I want wide shoulders. He said, okay, I'll get a blue fox with blue fox. I want a tight waist. I want a beautiful Italian derriere, and I want big breasts. There isn't a breast pad left in Manhattan. They were all in my costume. And I still have the shoes that he had made in Cleveland, because the play takes place in Cleveland. And somehow, William Ivy Long had these shoes made for me in Cleveland. I still, I still have them and use them for various rehearsals. So, Lend Me a Tenor closes, Hello Mata, Hello Fada opens. I have a ball, you have to sing, you have to dance. I even danced on a walker as an old person, work, working with the marvelous Jason Gras. 
uh, Steven Berger, Mary Testa, Paul Kreppel. <laughs> they were a riot. Jay Russell. Uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful time. I stayed in it as long as I could. By this time, Amanda, who'd been potty trained for Lend Me a Tenor, I think she was six or seven years old. Uh, Brandon was already going forward at collegiate. He must have been in at least junior high. During Hello, Mother, Hello, Father, you can go out to the audience and choose somebody to dance with. And Jason Gra went to Amanda Claire Levy in her party dress and brought her on that flat stage at the Circle and the Square downtown. And they danced. Thank you, Jason. I think as we get older, our work means a lot. To be excellent means a lot. You want to do your best. But kindness, kindness has a reverberation as the decades go on that is the blue ribbon of a good life. And when people are kind, no small kindness is small. I never forget it. So thank you, Chase. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, Tova out of her mind. Yes, yes, okay. I can tell you exactly when this was. This was in 1996. I was asked uh, to do my own one-woman show at Playhouse 91, being run at that time by Ron Avney and produced by Louise Westergaard. And I was uh, directed by Sarah Louise Lazarus, and I had this wonderful musical director, Scott Cady. Um, Tony Walton, who had done Lend Me a Tenor, did my set for me, and William Ivy Long designed my costumes. Relationships, relationships. Tova Out of Mind opened in a limited run at the 91st Street Playhouse, and instead of running three or four weeks, I think it ran the whole summer, probably 12. In the middle of it, on May the 11th, 1996, my father, Sidney, would pass away. And that night I went on. I was with my father all day uh, when he made that transition. And then I drove to the theater and I did the show. And at the curtain call of the show, I announced that my father had died that morning and that the audience was my Kaddish, which means that's the prayer for the dead. When uh, we bless God uh, for the blessings he's given us in life, it was probably written by ancient man, so afraid that he would blaspheme God at the loss of a loved one, that he wrote a, a well, beautiful prayer that embraces the spirit of, of, of God, whatever God you've got, whatever fourth dimension, whatever you think is beyond just your little self. It's a beautiful prayer. Yiskadal v'yiskadal shemei rabo, v'yom l'divroch yirusei v'yom l'ich malchusei, v'chaye chonu v'yom echonu v'chaye di chobe shishroel, b'galov ezban kari v'yimru, v'omein, etc. This is a prayer I learned backwards and forwards for Yentl. In all events, I announced that Jerry Zaks was in the audience that night, and the whole audience waited to meet me in the lobby to give me their condolences. And you can see what this meant to me. And now we go on to the vagina monologue. <clears throat> My mother, Lily, came to every show I ever did. Wait a minute, Tova. I'm not coming to see you in the Virginia monologues, I can't say the word, but three women in black dresses standing in front of three music stands talking about their Chachburgers. Forget it! So if there's movement and there's color and there's dancing, I'm getting hard of hearing, give me a ring. So to honor my mother, I took her to the Actors Fund benefit performance of Hair starring Will Swenson. It had color, it had movement, it had Will Swenson in his loincloth coming out into the audience at the end of act one. They always select a, an audience member and straddle their armrests. Will Swenson chose my mother. He was over my mother like the Arch of St. Louis in his loincloth. My mother was wearing a St. John's knit suit, Ferragamo heels, beautiful matching navy blue purse, of course, her white gloves were with her and the double strand of pearls that my father had given her with the sapphire brooch. 
So my mother is under Will Swenson's crotch, and she's looking up, and she's looking down. And she's looking up, and she's looking down. And as the house lights come up, I say, Mommy, how did you like Act One? She said, like it? I haven't had sex like this since Daddy died. Welcome, welcome to my mother, Lily, for whom I actually wrote an incredible memoir that I'd like to just show you. Lilyville is a memoir I wrote about the parent-child relationship. It's sold on Amazon, the usual. You can get it anywhere you want. And if you really miss me, you can get the audio book because I, I narrate the uh, on Audible and I'll keep you company and play all the different characters. It is written in a play form. That's why I'm sharing it with you. It really is part of my theater life. My theater life is so strong that it influenced the actual uh, creation of a memoir. There's my mother, Lily, and there am I actually at my bat mitzvah. It's a dress from Bonwood Tellers. I'm wearing my bat mitzvah pearls. I have matching green satin shoes that matches my green cummerbund, and I wore a Jackie Kennedy hat in the synagogue. But the, the piece is written in three acts with two intermissions. And between each, I don't give you chapters, I give you scenes. Between each scene is what we call an in one. In one is when Jared Grimes, for instance, in Funny Girl, comes down in front of the curtain and does his brilliant tap dancing solo as they're changing, frantically changing the scenery behind him. So I have, between each chapter is an in one, and those are my theater anecdotes, particularly about my mother, Lily. I took her to Miss Saigon and she came out and she said, isn't the point of theater not to have the helicopter? I thought that was an interesting comment. <laughs> Lilyville, mother, daughter, and other roles I played. It, it, uh, it has many anecdotes that if I, you don't get to hear now, you'll be able to hear by reading or listening to this book. When I did the vagina monologue, I was offered by David Stone the orgasm monologue, and I said, I can't do it. And he said, what do you mean? It's the best piece in the whole show. I said, I can't do the orgasm monologue because my children are alive. Anyway, I love doing the vagina monologues, and I love the people I work with. And after that, I wrote a play with the wonderful Linda Selman, who is a coach and was a brilliant actress in her salad days and is still a very close friend and it was called Tallulah Hallelujah. And it was all about Tallulah Bankhead showing up to entertain the USO with Ella Fitzgerald. She was just going to be the MC and Ella Fitzgerald was to be the entertainment. And Ella Fitzgerald doesn't show up, so Tallulah tries to entertain the troops herself. You know, pack up all your cares and rows, here I go, singing low, bye, bye, blackbird. So, we did Tallulah Hallelujah. Bette Midler came to see it. She came backstage and she said, it's wonderful, but did you ever consider singing anything by a living composer? <laughs> that was a great one. Um, many of my friends, Zoe Caldwell, Rosemary Harris, they all came to see Tallulah Bankhead. Really, really wonderful. Tulula Bankhead was filming the feature Lifeboat, and they were working in, in, at Warner Brothers in a water tank. And she was in the water tank. She had gone, gotten thrown over the boat in the water tank, and she was not wearing underwear. So the cameraman walked up to her and said, Miss Bankhead, um, please, could you put on underwear? We're not gonna pass the Hays Code. And Tulula said, does a woman who wants to be kissed wear a veil? And there you have it. So Tallulah Hallelujah ran at the Douglas Fairbanks Theater as my daughter Amanda was, was dancing at the New York State Theater at the time, being in one of her four seasons with the New York City Ballet. She was playing a uh, theater of 2000, I was playing a theater of 200, and our son Brandon was heavily playing soccer and basketball and baseball for collegiate school for boys. I took on the role of Golda's Balcony. And there was quite a respite from unlimited Broadway runs in that era when my children were matriculating. But Golda's Balcony was offered to me by the great Dave Fischelson and my manager at the time, the wonderful Jean Fox, said, you gotta take it. I said, gotta take it, it's just another Jewish mother. And Jean Fox was not even Jewish, said, it's not just a Jewish mother, it's the mother of a state. Take the play. And so I did, written by William Gibson, who had also written The Miracle Worker and Two for the Seesaw. This was a one-woman piece, 
And the reason I took it is that I also felt I could control when I'd be able to perform in case the children had certain needs and I wanted to accommodate them. Anyway, Golda's Balcony opened at um, the Manhattan Ensemble Theater down, way, way down in Soho. And you couldn't get in. It was a 140 seat theater. Again, lines around the block. My friend Christy Hefner, who I knew from National Music Camp, came to see it. All sorts of people came to see it, even in its off-Broadway run. Barbara Walters and, and Mike Wallace. It was such an honor. The past prime ministers of uh, Israel came. It was a great, a great honor. The head of security for the United States government came to see Golda's Balkan. And I wanted very much Henry Kissinger to come. He was going to come and he wanted to take me out to lunch. And then he was told that he was made fun of in the play. He was not made fun of, but he didn't come. He didn't come to see me. It was so sad. I said, Henry, is this the way you spoke when you were a baby? Did your mother go lullaby and good night? <laughs> anyway, Golda's Balcony, you would say, would be one of the high points of my career. Um, uh, we transferred from the Manhattan Ensemble Theater to the Helen Hayes Theater on 44th Street, and we became the longest running one woman show in the history of Broadway. 16 months. And do you know how many, do you know how many performances I've missed in 49 years on Broadway? Goose. Until Funny Girl, because we're in a different system now. Because of COVID and the brilliant Lisa Iacucci, who is our PSM, if you got a sniffle, you go home. Golda's Balcony would play from 2003 to 2005 on Broadway, and then I would continue to do it for years to come. Golda's Balcony would go on to play San Francisco, to play Los Angeles, and at the Los Angeles production at the Wadsworth Theater, where I played a thousand people a night, the Helen Hayes is only 685 seats. A man came backstage named Michael Kidd. And he held my face in his hands. And I said, thank you for my break. Thank you for letting me do cartwheels for you in Cyrano. And we cried. It was a good thing. He was a great fellow. He was a great soul. So. What happens? Yes, Golda's Balcony closes, and I'm doing film and television, Law and Order, etc. And then I am offered a wonderful role by Dan Gordon to be directed by Michael Parva called Irena's Vow. We opened off Broadway, had a tremendous success, and we would transfer, thanks to the generosity and love of Daryl Roth, uh, to the Walter Kerr Theater. And at that time, Jane Fonda was also on Broadway in an adjacent theater, and the Vietnam veterans were still demonstrating against her. So she would c come into her theater through my theater, to the Walter Kerr. And I got to see her again, and I hadn't seen her in years. I did pregnancy, birth, and recovery tape for her when I was giving, Brandon, uh, when I was giving birth to Brandon. It would be 1983 in Santa Monica, California. And I remember taping, I was one of the demonstration mothers. I had a full belly with a baby boy. I was sticking way out. Uh, I was one of the demonstration mothers and I filmed on my due date, which was July 25th. The Brandon wouldn't decide to visit the world till July 28th, but I was so proud that I earned a living in film right through my ninth month and um, broke a glass ceiling because in my day when you got pregnant, you were really asked to hide it. And the minute you showed, it was difficult to keep working. They didn't do the adjustments they now do today, which is wonderful. So, Arena's Vow transfers to the Walter Kerr. It's a magnificent story about this extraordinary teenager who saves a whole bunch of Semites who would otherwise die by hiding them in the very mansion where the Nazi officers are living because they found a secret passageway and a secret underground room in this particular house in the outskirts of what is now the Ukraine, but at that time was Poland. So I went to all over Poland. I went to the Ukraine. I went to Kiev to again, again visit 
Golda's place of origin. She actually was born in Pinsk, but raised in Kiev. And when the pogroms came, they transferred, they got themselves out of the country uh, to America and to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. When I was uh, researching Golda and went to Milwaukee, they said, you know why Golda became prime minister? I said, no, why? I said, it was to get out of Milwaukee. <laughs> I thought Milwaukee was great. And now we are at Pippin. I had become friendly with Fran and Barry Weisler when we did the workshop of the royal family. So one day I get a call at the house, and this was on the landline. I said, Tova, it's Barry Weisler. We'd like you to come down to uh, the Music Box Theater. We're interested in you playing the grandmother in Pippin. Can you come down and play on the trapeze? We'd like to see if trapeze is part of your world. I said, trapeze, part of my world. Okay. So I spoke to my wonderful agents, Stephen Unger and Phil Edelman of the Gage Group at that time. And they said, give it a shot. And I said, sure will. And I rode my bike to the theater. Phil said, you're riding your bike to the theater. I said, what better time to ride a bike to the theater than when you're trying out on a trapeze? So I biked down to the Music Box Theater I walk in and no sooner am I in the theater than I am hoisted 30 feet in the air on a trapeze, no belt, no mat, no insurance, and Barry is sitting in the audience of the music box and I'm swinging my legs, I'm up there, and he goes, Tova, 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 are you scared, scared, scared? I said, no, 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 are you? In all events, when I was a little girl, I had a swing set in my backyard in Scarsdale, and it had two swings, a, what we called a pedal pusher, and a little metal trapeze hung on, on chains. And in the summer, I wore my brother's brown shorts and a brown and yellow striped t-shirt and his hand-me-downs, and I would hang upside down on that trapeze with my knees you know, hanging from the trapeze. And in the winter, I had my green snowsuit. I had green snowsuit, green hat, green, green mittens, green um, boots. I had, I had an outfit. All my grandparents were immigrants, and my mother dressed us for every occasion, like I am dressed for you. I always believe in dressing for happy occasions. In all events, I used to hang from my childhood trapeze. So when I was up there 30 feet in the air, in my 60s, I was both 60-ish and three years old. I said, this is fabulous. I loved the trapeze. <clears throat> so they lowered me down, and I think I, I did a few things. I did a few pull-ups. I did a plank, did some stuff. And then I exited the theater and got on my bike. I thanked them very much. Fran said, thank you so much for coming, darling. I just love the way she talks. And I exited the theater, got on my bike, and all of a sudden, Barry Weisler, who's in incredible shape, we used to swim together at the same pool, came running after me on 45th Street. He said, where are you going, where are you going? I said, I'm going back home. He said, here, take a script. And I got to play Berta for six months on Broadway. Thank you, Andrea Martin, for your dressing room, for your place in your curtain call, for the orange chair you gave me when I left the production. Thank you for being such a great artist who heated up the stage for all the Bertas that followed. I was the first replacement in the company. I was with the whole A company, all the first choices of Diane Paulus, and I was the first one to replace Andrea, and I just think, I just felt so very lucky. So my mother, who comes to every show, wanted to come see Pippin. My brother, David Felchu, besides being a playwright, and a director and was head of the theater. Cornell's also an emergency room doctor. He said, you better show mom footage of you rehearsing so she doesn't have a heart attack at the theater with me kill her watching Pippin. So <clears throat> we did. I had an iPad at the time. I showed my mother. She came to the matinee. And of course, she was in another, another St. John suit, Ferragamo heels, everything matching, gorgeous earrings that daddy gave me. Daddy gave me these earrings. I said, thank you, mom. And, um, she watched the show, and if you did your job for Diane Paulus, if you did a full-out trapeze act while you're singing a hit song upside down, you were gonna get a standing ovation in the middle of the show, and I did that matinee. 
And I went to my mother after the, after the final curtain. I said, Mommy, Mommy, how did I do? And she said, Salva, that you should have to earn a living like this and on a trapeze yet. <laughs> that was my mother, Lily. <laughs> it was a wonderful run. And I got my circus body uh, that I tried to keep uh, for as long as possible. And of course, Funny Girl has helped me do that. I now have the American musical comedy diet. You can eat whatever you want if you're doing eight shows a week and you're dancing and singing and, and hoisting yourself down spiral staircases 600 times. The call came last summer in 2022, in June. A quiet call from Daryl Roth, whom I love, who has produced me in Arena's Vow, who produced me off Broadway in a play called Names, where I played Stella Adler. And she called and she said, Would you be interested in playing Rosie Bryce in Funny Girl? I said, I don't know. Why don't I? see the show, and why don't you send me a script? So I went down to the theater, to the August Wilson Theater, and had the privilege of watching Beanie Feldstein and Jane Lynch do Funny Girl. I watched it once, I watched it twice, and I went to watch it a third time, and Julie Banco was in for the wonderful Beanie, and it was a completely different interpretation of Fanny. And as I watched, the two leading ladies do this with Jane. I said, I think I could do something with this part. And they had obviously been talking to Leah Michelle as well, because we were paired together in the negotiation and in our entry point uh, for the show, which was originally going to be September 29th, and then it changed to September 6th, and then they wanted me earlier, and I was completing two movies, I couldn't do it. But they worked around me, and I put in extra hours of study. I was gifted with the incredible musical director, Michael Rafter. Uh, what a blessing he is in my life. And with Michael Mayer, who loves his actors. He is a man of heart. He is a man who has faith in the people he casts. And he, he certainly directed me with an open hand, and I remain ever grateful, because that way I could give him my best, which I try to do eight times a week. I don't try to do it, which I do eight times a week. I am still in Funny Girl. I am thrilled to be in Funny Girl. Leah Michelle is a genius, and her standby, or should I say the Thursday night, uh, Fanny, Julie Benko, is also totally magnificent and one of the best actors I've ever worked with. The people in the ensemble, I can't do what they can do. I watch them every night in Rat-a-tat-tat. -tat. I have such admiration. I'm standing there, off stage left, ready for the next scene. I'm all ready, and I watch those dancers go. I watch those dancers sing, and I say, gee whiz, I'm on Broadway.